being late. I have a few other uh, pressing matters going on here in the legislature. Uh, we, we do have enough members for a quorum, and so, uh, Jane, if you could please call the roll. Senator Cedillo? Here. Cedillo here. Dutton or Pesa Amistad? Here. Amistad here. Steinberg? Here. A quorum has been established. Uh, let me begin the meeting, though, by uh, congratulating the two gentlemen that are sitting to my left, uh, Greg Schmidt, Secretary of our Senate, and uh, Senator Sa Sam Onested, new grandfathers Yay. in the last couple of days. <laughs> we, <laughs> we hope everybody is, hope everybody, uh, mothers and children are all doing well and are healthy. That's great. Okay. Now to uh, the business at hand. We do have uh, four gubernatorial appointees appearing today. And why don't we begin with Mary S. Fernandez as Under Secretary of the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it's, it's the tradition here of the committee to allow uh, the nominee to introduce uh, his or her family member, family members, close personal friends, uh, please. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Hope this isn't too boring, you know. Okay. Sure, it's, it won't be. But uh, welcome to you, uh, Ms. Fernandez. Would you like to make a brief opening statement about how you see this, uh, this role that you are Undertaking? Like Please. Uh, I would like to thank the Senate Rules Committee for giving me the opportunity to address my work experience and how I am leveraging my experience in my role as Undersecretary of Administration for CDCR. I am a career civil servant and have 30 years experience with other administrative functions, 14 years at the executive level. I am currently working to improve the Department's accountability so that taxpayer dollars are spent effectively. I have sponsored several fiscal control projects as Secretary Gates cost control measures to reduce expenditures. These projects have already yielded some significant savings. For example, early this year we performed a state vehicle audit to inventory and assess the use of our state vehicles. The audit is nearly complete and we are currently implementing policies to tighten up our vehicle coverage. In addition, we are auditing our positions, working to reconcile the hundreds of positions that are not properly in line with the budget. We also completed a review of the 4,300 headquarter positions and eliminated over 430. We have inventoried handheld devices, Blackberries and cell phones, and cut expenses by more than half a million dollars. In response to the criticism of our lease management, I recently chartered a strike team to review, consolidate, and monitor our leases. And that was just last month. We've already canceled 400 million, excuse me, $400,000 in leases. I am guiding several important initiatives in the area of human resources, including succession planning and leadership training. And in the area of information technology, the implementation of a tool to automate our admin processes and systems, and another IT system to streamline and automate our inmate case records. During my career, I have always enjoyed making a difference, and I am very challenged by the issues facing CDCR. I believe that by working with the talented and passionate employees of the department, we will improve our admin functions. I will continue my efforts to move towards effectiveness, transparency, and accountability at CDCR, CDCR and I look forward to working with you to achieve that vision. Thank you for considering me for this very important role. Thank you. Um, I'll begin, if I may. Um, you are taking this uh, position on during the most difficult of financial and budget times, and as I look at all of the things that you are responsible for as an assistant secretary, uh, automating inmate records and files, the physical state of many of our facilities. I know that Mr. Bailey and Mr. Gladstone visited Pleasant Valley Prison uh, this past winter and saw a gym where water was literally pouring through the roof onto an inmate's Bad, Mr. Bailey can correct me if I'm 
if I'm misstating anything. Um, the issues of overtime, especially in remote prisons, uh, the issue we spoke about with Matt Kate at great length about attracting and, re and, and retaining top managers here so that there isn't so much turnover in a training and management plan to, to do that. How do you approach these various challenges in the midst of this difficult budget environment that we find ourselves in? Well, number one, uh, as I have found low-hanging fruit, at what I just mentioned in my opening statement, I have gone after that, those uh, issues and put together teams to start working on them. And the way I approach it is by using a project management approach so that things don't fall by the wayside. I make sure that every project has a charter, has action plans, has due dates. We meet regularly, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, to make sure that people are moving forward on the initiatives and, um, and monitor, as, monitor it as we're going along. In addition, I feel very strongly that in order to get after some long-term big changes, we need to develop a good, solid strategic plan. And that will incorporate many of the things that you talked about. So we are working towards our strategic plan. It's going to be a very much a actionable strategic plan. It will not be a sit on the shelf. In previous departments that I've worked at, I have uh, implemented strategic plans both at DPA back in the 90s and at State Personnel Board, and both of those strategic plans moved the organization to change. And when, uh, when can we expect the strategic plan to be public? We are working through it right now. I would expect late summer, early fall. You know, given all of the challenges um, with the budget right now, we are. And, and how long will the strategic plan take to implement what's it once? I expect it is implementation out there. to begin immediately. There will be action plans with due dates, and you'll start seeing results. When will it be completed? I believe we're going after a three year plan, three to five. I don't know that we've settled on that yet. Well, what? Let me ask it maybe a different way. And I, you know, from your work record and references and what everyone says that you are, um, you know, you are suited to take on this challenge. Um, but you're one person. And I sort of want to get your sense as sort of the chief uh, administrator, if you will, what the state of corrections is right now. I mean, do, what, what People are out there smiling. Well, uh, uh, you know, what do you see as broken that needs to be that needs to be fixed? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that one of the reasons I uh, decided to go to corrections was after I met Matt Kate and Brett Morgan. They definitely have a vision for where mm -hmm. they want corrections to go, and they understood the value of strategic planning. So that was one reason that I went to the department. Um, there's also all of my managers are extremely talented. There's a uh, crisis every day that everyone, right now we're dealing with the H1N1. I mean, you see us in the paper every day, every hour, there's another crisis. We need a good strategic plan to help focus people, to get those talented people moving forward to, to change the department. I'd like a little more specificity, please. I mean, I, I want to have an honest dialogue here about what's we all know that oh, some specifics about corrections. That corrections, and I think the world of Matt Kate, and I think he's the right leader, and no issue there. But corrections is a mess. I mean, and how do you see it from where you sit and stand? And what is the most important thing you want to accomplish over the next, you know, 18 months to begin turning around the common perception that? Debt corrections is a mess. Right. Well, I work on that every day. Um, there are many positive areas in the department, particularly IT. I did have a lot of interaction with the department back in the 90s, and IT was pretty much a joke. And there was really no automation. There was nothing happening. Now we have the Biz Project and the Psalms Project that are going to take us into the 21st century. And I'm very proud of that, and I like to get our folks out talking about it, spreading the word that Corrections is doing uh, a good job in that area. The other area that we're working on that you spoke with Secretary Kate about is the uh, succession planning area. And we have a succession plan now. We've done a gap analysis. We've rolled out to 12 institutions. 
and we are beginning to develop plans so that our uh, feeder classes can move into some of the leadership roles out in the institutions. What is gap analysis? Gap analysis is where you determine what you're going to need in the future. You take a, you take a look at the aging popu uh, employee population, and then you decide where, where are we going to need people, how many, in what classes. And as far as what I, my immediate goal I think, as you can hear from my opening statement, is that I want to get our costs in control. We have many things that are unfunded. The state cars weren't completely funded. Uh, the Blackberries weren't completely funded. So I want to try to get our, our uh, fiscal situation in control, including overtime, which we've had great success at this year. And um, also, through the biz system, we'll have a better handle on where we're at fiscally more frequently. Okay, uh, Senator Stutton, Onstead. Well, since you brought up overtime. Yes. Uh, I, along with the, the rest of the public that I, uh, that I talk to, cannot comprehend nearly half a billion dollars in overtime costs. Um, especially when we see uh, and I'll just uh, be frank, this was a, a topic of discussion at our Republican caucus lunch today uh, regarding uh, costs, and overspending, and poor management. Um, when we see a prisoner brought into a private hospital or, a, or one of the local hospitals uh, by helicopter, uh, accompanied by uh, four armed guards at the time and four more, uh, I believe that at, at the, during the uh, time that he was in the hospital, there were 14 separate uh, correctional officers um, uh, in charge of uh, guarding this in one individual in the hospital. In another instance, in another hospital not far away where they have an entire floor dedicated uh, to treating CDC pr prisoners. Um, uh, the, the ratio was two guards for eight, each patient, uh, which uh, uh, in some instances exceeds the nurse patient, patient ratio uh, in California. And uh, the hospital actually had come up with a plan uh, suggested to uh, CDC uh, were uh, for a fraction of the cost, they could close the entire floor off and put one or two officers in charge of security and have it just as secure, and they could get nowhere with administration as far as listening to the proposal and the status quo exists today. So I'm curious as to your statement that you think you're controlling overtime costs when we see such frank mismanagement. And I think the public uh, would, would like to have some reassurance that something is being done uh, at the outrageous uh, cost to the taxpayers through I, what I believe is mismanagement of, of, of uh, the uh, guard's time. I have to say that I agree with you. Um, I think it's an area that we need to look at. There are three drivers of overtime, and we were at a half a million dollars in 2007-8, and we're down uh, to 375 million this year. And the three drivers of overtime are vacant positions, sick leave, and the guarding and transportation um, for medical. And the two areas that we've had great success at is reducing our number of vacancies and instituting sick leave policies so that uh, those costs have come down tremendously. The medical guarding, as you know, is under the receivership as far as when they go out, if they go out by helicopter, all of that. We are working with the receiver. Um, things are, over the last probably three months, have become much more amicable between us, and we are discussing these types of issues, and this, that is one of the issues we need to go after and figure it out. I agree with you completely. Are you comfortable that you, as an individual, I don't, can it do won't something be, about this? It won't be me as an individual. It'll be our management team. It'll be under Secretary Kernan. It'll be Secretary Kate and it'll be Chief of Staff Brent Morgan. And we'll be working with them, as we have on other issues. And yet, uh, I'll be 
honest with you, when we work in teams in this building, oftentimes things don't get done as, as much as one person with a burr under their bonnet going after it, and it gets done. Um, I, I've not worked in your bureaucracy, so I, I don't know if there's any way we can put a burr under your bonnet, but you're certainly in the right chair uh, to be able to affect something. And as I mentioned, it is one of my major initiatives, is overtime. And we do have a, a, a current analysis baselining overtime. We needed it to get a handle on where we were at with overtime, what all the drivers were, get all the data together, and we're providing that to Department of Finance this month. And we will be having a dialogue with them and then the receiver to figure out how we're going to move forward. And I will be a driver of this, but I, I cannot do it alone. And we are a very collaborative team. Thank you. And we are becoming collaborative with the receiver also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Dutton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I uh, actually uh, enjoyed the time that I uh, was able to uh, talk with uh, Undersecretary uh, Fernandez. And, and I've, I've got a lot of confidence. As a matter of fact, I told her, I said, you know, the thousand Blackberry issue and the amount of savings involved with that, she's already actually covered her first year salary and benefits, so I'm <laughs> looking forward. <laughs> so I'm actually kind of looking forward to, to whatever else she may be coming up with. But um, I think also, too, along the lines of what uh, uh, Senator Amstead was talking as well, is I think it's important for us to also pledge that we'll give her support uh, to try if there's a requirement. I've already made this offer to her if she's got issues or concerns that somehow we need to have some type of legislative clearance or something like that. I, I told her I was sure that uh, everybody, uh, Democrat and Republican alike, would certainly welcome uh, any thoughts or ideas on how to do things more efficient and more beneficial. So I'm pleased with this nominee. I don't really have any questions, but I did want to make just that general statement. And I'll be more than happy to make the uh, motion to approve her nomination when it's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, you can put the motion on the for now. Okay, then so moved. Moved by Senator Dutton. I have one other question and then we'll take uh, witnesses. Just in terms of the strategic plan and, and time frames again, uh, when do you expect the department will complete the automation of the inmate files as Texas <coughs> and other states have accomplished? The contract just got signed and it looks like phase three is completed in 2013. How many phases are there? There's three phases. The adult institution files will be done by 2012. The paroles will be done by 2012. And then DJJ will be done 2013. Okay. Hopefully we'll be out of the budget crisis by then. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, witnesses in support of the nominee. Just the way we'll do it is let, let's use that mic there. If people can stand up and kind of get in line, uh, we'll take uh, the testimony. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, it's kind of interesting, just kind of casually leaning against her. Uh, <laughs> lo lo loosen the tie. <laughs> <laughs> may sell it if things keep going the way they're going for the state of California. Uh, my name is Russell Snyder. I'm the executive director of the California Asphalt Pavement Association and uh, a former uh, quality program manager and deputy director for policy and administration for the California Department of Transportation, uh, everybody's favorite agency. They love to hate Caltrans. Um, I'm here, I'm compelled to be here because um, uh, Mary Fernandez is um, uh, hands down the most impressive uh, leader and manager I've ever come across in my, my uh, experience uh, working in state government and also uh, since I've been uh, left state service in 2000, 2002. Uh, unbelievably uh, optimistic, very effective, bulletproof credibility, uh, able to move mountains. I mean, I, I know that uh, any one person can't solve all the challenges that we face today. It does take a collaborative effort, and I've never seen anybody uh, be more effective and uh, move uh, the bureaucracy of state government and get things done and get uh, buy-in from everybody, uh, as Mary has. And so um, I just had to be here today. I'm pleased I was had the opportunity to go first. I 
she's uh, wonderful. She'll stir, serve the state well. And uh, doggone it, these days we need everybody's best efforts. So um, uh, I wholeheartedly endorse her. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. Next. Good afternoon, Senator and uh, honorable uh, Senate members. I'm here in, in support of uh, Under Secretary Mary Fernandez. My name is Sam Hassoun, and I'm here representing the Associated General Contractors of California, AGC. It's a trades association that has over 1,500 uh, heavy construction <coughs> members throughout the state. Uh, my knowledge of Ms. Fernandez spans well over 15 years. When I worked at Caltrans, I worked in the director's office and I was in charge of the quality management program and innovation during uh, the Wilson administration and Jim Van Lovensels was the director at the time. The charge was for Ms. Fernandez to rally all the state agencies and to march in the direction of cost cutting, innovation, and working through bureaucracies to actually eliminate waste and cost. That was a tall order. During that period, when I worked with Ms. Fernandez, budget times were tough. In fact, Caltrans was going through layoffs during that period, and there was a huge distrust and mistrust between management, employee unions, and the like. And despite that, it was a championship and a leadership from Ms. Fernandez that was able to rally many of us, despite all types of adversity at the time, budget, personnel, and morale, and so forth, and managed to actually systematically help us go through the cost cutting and the effectiveness. She also led the innovation in government uh, shortly thereafter. And when I was working in the private sector, she effectively managed to partner with private industry to solve many of the problems that government alone could not. So her leadership and her ability to build consensus and to get us all focused on the problem at hand <laughs> and to come up with innovative solutions that frankly, and I agree with the Senator Amstead, that bureaucracy alone may not be able to solve, but she knows how to leverage industry in actually cutting through a lot of the issues and provides uh, support. I must add, she did all of that without the use of one ounce of Prozac or any substances to help <laughs> move that. And to that end, I lend my support to Ms. Fernandez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, Ted Toppin for the Professional Engineers in California Government and the California Association. I'm Ted sorry. Toppin for the Professional Engineers in California Government and the California Association of Professional Scientists. In uh, strong support for confirmation, Peg and Caps have uh, worked with Ms. Fernandez many times over the years, uh, inside and outside of government. Um, most recently, she is a uh, uh, member of the board of the Caps and Peg sponsored science, uh, uh, Sacramento Science and uh, Engineering Fair, uh, spends countless hours uh, creating the next generation of scientists and engineers. She is smart, hardworking, creative, and an asset to any organization she works in, and Corrections is lucky to have her. Very good. Thank you very much. Mr. Wanakot. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Richard Wanacott, spelling on the last is W-O-O-N as in Nancy, A-C-O-T-T. -T. I believe the committee has my letter in its file. I just wanted to be here in person to lend my support to an individual who I have had the opportunity to span three administrations working with as well as quite a bit of time in the building. And she's not only a tremendous colleague, but also, and also a tremendous friend. And I just wanted to be here to support her confirmation. Thank you. No, sometimes people come up and testify and, you know, they sort of say what's on the script. Every one of these folks, you tell it's heartfelt, comes across. Very good. Opposition? This probably be a heartfelt, too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you for the thought. Mr. Warren. My name is David Warren. I'm appearing today on behalf of Taxpayers for Improving Public Safety. Under ordinary circumstances, we would welcome a breath of fresh air into the Department of Corrections. But as the chair pointed out, the Department of Corrections is in a horrific state, not only financially, but <clears throat> with labor, uh, labor problems, problems with the prison overcrowding, pro conflicts with the medical receiver, and all sorts of issues. And we, we would hope that someone with more experience within the department currently would be in this position. We have problems. That, uh, right now at uh, institutions where they can't find a can of oil to put into a leaky crankcase in a car. They can't, we can't find photocopy paper or inkjet cartridges in order to print various documents inside the prison. 
we need someone who can call up someone in Ironwood and say, I, where are the paper clips? Why aren't they out there? Someone who can call someone at Pelican Bay and say, you're in charge of this, why isn't this done? This requires experience and contacts within the institutions. And regretfully, it's been over a decade since the nominee has worked with the Department of Corrections. And for this reason, this reason alone, under the current circumstance, some, if things were different, we would be supportive. But today, we have to oppose the nominee. Thank you. Fair enough. All right, other witnesses in opposition? All right, um, I, I'm prepared to support the nominee. Uh, and uh, I do hope, though, that you take the, uh, I forgot who said it a few minutes ago, one of the witnesses, that um, you take it on yourself uh, in this position to rattle the cages, you know, and to be very aggressive. You seem to have uh, a quiet but very effective style in getting, in getting done what needs to be done. I would just uh, hope that you go into this position essentially with the same um, sense that we have, that across government, certainly, including the legislative branch of government, and including the Department of Corrections changes the order of the day, and you're in a position to help, you know, to help make it happen. So just encourage you to be aggressive in that in that regard. Thank you. Senator Dutton? Yeah, just in, in response to one thing, I mean, I agree 100% with what uh, you just said. You know, it's been my experience, too, as a, as a professional facilities manager and, and somebody who's dealt in operations, that sometimes, you know, a, clean, a, a new broom sleeps clean. And so it may be actually to our benefit right now to have somebody who's not so directly uh, attached to, to the status quo or what's going on because Maybe you do need to have somebody who says, okay, well, how do I, f I'm sure you know where the paper clips and the bathroom are by now. You've been there for eight months. <laughs> but no, you want somebody to ask those questions now, because I, I don't, I think that's probably been part of our problem is just maintaining status quo, certainly isn't getting this there. So I just, uh, anyway, I just, I think uh, this individual, I just renewed my motion, but uh, I think she's uh, got the background to do the job. So I'm pleased to support her. Very good, please call the roll. Senator Cedillo. Dutton? Aye. Dutton, aye. Orpeza? Honested? Honested, aye. Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, aye. It's three to nothing. We'll leave the roll open for Senator Cedillo, who I believe is in another committee right now. And uh, your nomination will uh, pass the Rules Committee and, and head to the floor of the Senate. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right, let's move on to Stephen uh, L. Edinger as a member of the Oil Response, uh, or excuse me, it's a member of the OSRP. Uh, and he's we'll clarify that. Clarify it. <laughs> Straighten me out, will you, please? I, I will. Okay. Well, uh, welcome. F please feel free to introduce any member of your family or close friend uh, or guest in the audience. No, if, if I might, I'd like to introduce my family, uh, my lovely wife of 25 years, Terry, um, my uh, three beautiful kids, uh, Zachary, uh, Chelsea, and Mackenzie, um, who are more than happy to be here, I think. I hope so, anyway. Welcome to all of you. Get involved. <laughs> Get involved. All right. Uh, if, I, if I might make a brief opening statement. Um, President Pro Tem Steinberg and members of the committee, it is a distinct honor and privilege to appear before you today. I am honored that Governor Schwarzenegger has placed his trust and confidence in me by appointing me to the position of Administrator of the Department of Fish and Game Office of Spill Prevention and Response. I wish to thank you, uh, President Pro Tem uh, Steinberg, and the members of the committee for holding this hearing to consider my appointment. If confirmed, you have my commitment that I will work hard to maintain the confidence and trust that the governor and you have shown in me in pr to protect California's wildlife. I'm very proud to be sitting in this chair seeking this confirmation as administrator of OSPR. My appointment is a reflection of my years and hard work in protecting California's citizens, environment, and wildlife. More importantly, I'm proud to represent the dedicated professional men and women of the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. OSPAR is an exceptional organization within the Department of Fish and Game staffed by individuals who truly believe in what they do. I sit here today humbled in knowing that I have their full support as administrator. If I'm confirmed, I pledge to continue efforts in, to improve California's, 
protection of wildlife and habitats from the devastating effects of oil spills. These efforts initiated during my tenure include increased outreach to and participation by local government, adoption and implementation of new volunteer plan to address convergent oil spill volunteers, evaluation and adoption of new technologies to meet the statutory mandated best achievable protection standard, expanded and improved wildlife recovery and transport through development and delivery of wildlife response training to volunteers, and updating the California oil spill contingency plan. These initiatives, when completed, should pay dividends for years to come, strengthening California's environmental protection. Again, thank you for your consideration today, and I look forward to addressing any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, you are the third administrator now in four years for mm -hmm. the agency, correct? And, of course, the incident that uh, the public and the legislature focused on uh, preceding your tenure mm -hmm. was the Costco Busan incident, which, of course, received wide, uh, wide coverage. And you say in your written response that you view the agency as uh, the premier response organization mm -hmm. when it comes to oil spills. And yet, you also say external and internal reviews identified the need for enhanced efforts by OSPR to increase local government volunteer participation, address fisheries closure, shorten response times, increase wildlife recovery efforts, and increase drill participation and oversight. We also know that at the time of the incident that your office, and again, you weren't the administrator, but I'm just I'm leading to the question mm -hmm. here that you, your office uh, could not get uh, to within one mile, they were within one mile of the spill, they couldn't get to the spill for two hours and 20 minutes because there was not a boat to take them. So I guess the question that lingers here is, <clears throat> since this incident, it's wide coverage, the oversight hearings that the legislature held, is it different? And if so, uh, how is it different, and what have you done to make it different? Well, Senator, it's an outstanding question, because uh, the Costco Busan was somewhat of an eye-opening um, event for um, our office. Um, it was a uh, response that actually went very well, if you look at the amount of oil that was picked up. Uh, the collection of oil on the, the water uh, was about 43 percent which when if you compare that to an industry standard of about 10 percent, you know, we did very well. But we did learn many things during that response. You know, this is the first time that we had convergent volunteers who wanted to clean up uh, oil spills or wanted to clean up oil themselves. We've always had people that wanted to clean up wildlife or protect wildlife, but we've never had people want to clean up the beaches themselves. Uh, we've never had this uh, level of participation by local government or the, the desire um, but we've taken all of that to heart and made many changes. Um, during the Costco Busan, um, I was actually initially assigned to the department's operations center, and I um, said that's not good enough, and I went down to uh, San Francisco and took over as a state on-scene coordinator, and I stayed there in that position for three weeks to make sure that this went well. Um, since the Costco Busan, we have had many changes. We've had um, much more local participation. As an example, we just had a drill in the Port of Richmond uh, a couple weeks ago where we had local participants. We had six different agencies, uh, local agencies where they actually participated. We were able to take um, a, somebody from local government and put them into the unified command so they were helping to make decisions. Uh, we have implemented a new volunteer plan to handle convergent volunteers. Uh, we've made many changes. Uh, once again, I think uh, it's a proud organization that has done well, but uh, anytime we have a spill of this, this significance, we're going to learn things and we will make those changes. Let's just take a couple of, sorry, let's just take a couple of the issues. Um, are you working on consolidating authority for pipeline regulation where apparently your office and the state fire marshal seem to share authority over the state of, uh, of pipes? Well, the state fire marshal's office does uh, regulate pipelines. That's not something that we do. We have uh, jurisdiction and control if there is a spill. You know, certainly we work with state fire marshal's office. 
Uh, we work with uh, Dogger and other uh, agencies to make sure that there aren't spills. But uh, right now, there is no initiative for the OSPR to take over regulation of pipelines. If there were, you know, God forbid, to be another Costco Busan that mm -hmm. would occur, uh, are you confident that uh, your office would be able to respond more quickly than what occurred uh, when that incident took place? Absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the failures that I, I looked at, and I, I say it's a, a room for improvement, was the lack of getting in front of the story, the ability to get out the information that the public wants, that the public demands. Um, we've changed that. Uh, we've put together a website modeled on other emergency response organizations to push that information out, to get out in front of the story. Um, if something were to go on in the Bay Area, you talked a little bit about us not having a vessel available. Um, that was um, uh, a problem that we had. We were in the process of purchasing, purchasing the uh, vessel, um, but it had gone to rebid. That vessel is now on the water. It is an uh, all-weather all vessel that is ready to go should this occur. Questions? Members? Witnesses in support? Mr. Toppin. Busy day in Rules Committee. Huh? There's a rule here. You get to testify once <laughs> per year. Uh, Ted Toppin for the California Association of Professional Scientists in strong support of Mr. Edinger's uh, confirmation. Um, CAPS represents about 500 uh, state scientists at the Department of Fish and Game, including 50-some at uh, the Office of uh, Spill Prevention and Response. Uh, my membership and leadership uh, was impressed with his performance during Costco Busan and his leadership of the department since, um, and strongly supports confirmation. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Good afternoon, uh, Jerry Carner with the California Fish and Game Warden Association. Um, we uh, strongly uh, support uh, Steve Edinger for this. I uh, believe he's an excellent um, candidate for this position. He has a unique ability to um, and knowledge to respond to oil spills. He has overseen lots of oil spills and uh, those situations. Uh, one thing that uh, President Pro Tem uh, Steinberg, you brought up with the fact as far as uh, um, uh, the department having a better response to uh, oil spills. There, there are going to be more oil spills like Costco Busan. And uh, Ed, uh, Steve Enninger, he, he knows that. Uh, and one of the, the, of course, you guys know about the crisis, about the shortage of fish and game wardens. The wardens, uh, whether uh, inland or also uh, the marine and OSPR, uh, the enforcement officers are ones that generally respond to these initial uh, attacks, well, you, if you may. And uh, and then also some of our patrol boats, which are state-of-the-art, uh, a lot of times they're more at port than they are at sea. So once we get that figured out, and uh, uh, I think uh, Steve's job is going to be easier. And the, the fact that uh, he understands the ability to do with what he has, uh, I think he has that uh, uh, in his uh, uh, background. But the Ward Association supports him and hope uh, you do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, my name is George Osborne. I represent Advanced Cleanup Technologies Incorporated. Uh, my client is an oil spill response organization that uh, responded to the Costco Busan oil spill in San Francisco Bay and had the opportunity to work under the direction of Mr. Edinger. Uh, they speak very highly of him. They've had an opportunity to observe his work as administrator since he was appointed, and we strongly support his confirmation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Arnold. I'm here today representing the California Fish and Game Warden Supervisors and Managers Association. Our association wishes to support Mr. Edinger for appointment to the position of Administrator of the Department of Fish and Game's Office of Spill Prevention and Response. Over the last 12 years, our members have witnessed Mr. Edinger's professionalism and attention to detail. Mr. Mr. Edinger has a proven track record as an emergency responder, emergency manager, and a law enforcement commander. Our association supports Mr. Steve Edinger for appointment to this position. Thank you very much. Very good. Are there any witnesses uh, in opposition to the nominee? If not, is there a motion? Moved by uh, Senator Honested. 
pleased to support uh, your nomination. Um, you do have the benefit, really, of looking at this high-profile incident, and you know it seems to me your responsibility is very well defined, which is how to make sure that uh, we, as the state and this particular agency, do better if this uh, ever happens again. And uh, I think you're you're definitely up to it. Oh, thank you. Please call the roll. Senator Cedillo. Cedillo aye. Cedillo I. Dutton. Aye. Dutton I. Oropesa. Honested. Aye. Honested I. Steinberg. Aye. Steinberg I. Four to nothing. Uh, that will move to the floor. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Let, let's go back to um, Ms. Fernandez and open the roll. Senator Cedillo. Uh, it's a three to nothing vote for Mary S. Fernandez as the Undersecretary for the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Please open the roll. Senator Cedillo. Cedillo I. Orpeza. Four to nothing. That is out. Appreciate it. Let me welcome uh, Tam M. Dudak. Yes. If I pronounce that correctly, I'm sorry. Fr and Francis S. Weber. Let's. Spivey Weber. And to Spivey Weber as the member of the State Water Resources Control Board. Why don't we take both uh, nominees at the same time? Welcome uh, to both of you. Again, I want to extend you the, the privilege of introducing anybody in the audience that uh, you want to introduce. I will introduce my husband, Michael Weber, who's right there. Welcome, sir. And uh, Art Baggett from the board is also here in the back. Welcome, Mr. Baggett. And Maggot. I expect Charlie Hoppin to join us uh, fairly soon. Okay. Mr. Thank Dr. you, Senator. I don't have any family members here, but they are by the phone eagerly awaiting a call from me. <laughs> okay. Well, very good. Very good. All right. Uh, if you'd both like to begin with brief opening statements, uh, we'll then uh, ask some questions. Um, I'll start. Uh, I've served on the water board for just over two years. And during that time, as uh, you are probably aware, we've had funding cuts, reductions in staff, and most recently furloughs. Yet, the State Water Board has um, many successes that I and my colleagues are building on. During my tenure, we have completed nine statewide policies and permits. We expect to complete uh, 10 more by the end of the year and eight more next year, uh, totaling 27. Uh, current, some of these policies include recycled water, once through cooling, um, stormwater construction permit enforcement, and the ocean plan. Our multi-pronged uh, Bay Delta strategy adopted last summer is on track. We're starting this year with uh, work on the San Joaquin River flows and the South Delta salinity issues, and next year we'll take up Bay Delta water quality planning that will uh, go into 2011. We have a new Office of Enforcement, and last year we reduced the 14,000 mandatory minimum penalty violations by 93%. This year we're, we have adopted, or are uh, working on and will adopt a statewide approach to setting penalties and have adopted a policy on how to spend penalty money, plus we're establishing enforcement performance standards. We're interested in uh, and are invested, investing in easy to use web-based uh, information for the public. Uh, to make the water board issues more accessible. We now have a uh, web-based, uh, excuse me, web-based web uh, uh, access for enforcement issues, for ocean uh, areas of special biological uh, significance, for uh, sanitary sewer overflows, water rights, water quality. And we're going to soon have the Water Quality Monitoring uh, Council's web portal up answering questions like, is the water safe to drink? Is the, are the fish safe to eat? Can you swim? We got $270 million of, of uh, stimulus money in May, and as of this week, we have about $100 million that is out uh, to uh, out on the street, and uh, $72 million of the $100 million has gone to urban areas, uh, $24 million to rural areas, and $28 million to disadvantaged communities. Uh, we're uh, working on TMDLs, and I can go into that more uh, if you have questions. And we've uh, been working uh, on water rights uh, in a significant way. We have uh, reduced the pending applications for water rights 35 percent. Even with a staff reduction of 30 percent, we uh, 
got a Yuba agreement this year, which opened up, uh, uh, ended 22 years of, of litigation and opened up uh, 260,000 acre feet of water in dry years and, uh, and 574,000 acre feet of water in wet years. We uh, terminated permits for the Auburn Dam and um, we have uh, reduced paper water by a million ac uh, acre feet by moving the Nevada Irrigation District from a permit to a license. So these are successes on which we are and will build. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator, members. Um, thank you for your time today and recognizing how valuable it is. I'm gonna keep my comments very short. Uh, as a member of the State Water Board now for four years, I take very seriously the charge that we have to protect all beneficial uses and to allocate our precious water resources, balancing all the various competing needs and demands. I am very proud of the work that the Board has done over the past four years, of which Ms. Spivey uh, Weber has mentioned. But I also recognize that there is a lot that still needs to be done, that must be done uh, in a with urgency, but also with deliberation in order to solve and address our state's tremendous water quality and water supply problems. So I commit to doing so um, and to discharging my, my duties to the best of my abilities, always keeping in mind how vital water is to our state, uh, to our state's <laughs> present, the, our state's economy, our state's future. I thank you for this opportunity and uh, look forward to having at a discussion. Very good. Now I have a few questions, but you know, I don't always have to go first. Any, any member want to? Okay. I am going first. Um, you know, one of the things we're interested in uh, as we uh, talk to nominees in various parts of state government is how and whether you view yourself as a change agent or uh, essentially an administrator of the existing law. And it is, um, I think important in this area as well, because when I look at the organization here, you have nine regional water boards, plus uh, of nine members apiece, plus the five state members. You've got 86 people, 10 different entities, in charge of uh, water quality here in California. And the little Hoover Commission, um, you know, essentially said this is a system that has lost the confidence of most of the stakeholders. So what is your view on reorganization, consolidation? And if you believe that's necessary, what are you doing in your public role to promote it and move it forward? I'll let Tim go first, because he worked very hard on this last year. I, and I am sure we're on the same Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. And my answer most definitely is I see us as a change agent. Uh, having said that, I will tell you after the experience of the past four years, change is very hard, very, very hard, uh, especially, as you mentioned, for an organization that's been around for almost 40 years, which is so diverse and so broad. Uh, and add to that, we actually do share our water responsibility with a myriad of other agencies throughout the state. That having been said, though, we did spend uh, the, the regional board chairs and I um, last year, along with my colleagues on the state water board and our staff, spent a significant amount of time last year putting together a legislative proposal in response to then Senator Paradas, I believe it was Senate Bill 1176, which proposed some reorganization to the water board structure. And um, the proposal that the water boards put together, we did share with your staff. We've also put it on our website. And it proposes uh, many, in my opinion, important and necessary changes from addressing the 10% conflict rule that uh, have stymied appointments to the board to looking at how we can uh, make more efficient the TMDL approval process, uh, to how we can strengthen our enforcement abilities, uh, to, yes, looking at reducing the numbers of board members on the Regional Water Board, um, and also looking at, um, in my, what I would view as ensuring more accountability 
to the regional water boards and state board system by institutionalizing performance measure and metrics. Um, and then my, my hope uh, is that uh, there, there is still interest in such, and I'm very glad to hear you ask that question because I do hope there is still an interest in making those changes and that we could explore those possibilities further. Thank you. I'll just add that uh, so far no one has really taken up our, uh, our suggestions and moved with them. And so we are uh, actively looking for, uh, it's not too late, and we're actively looking for, for support for now or in the, in the future. Let me ask you about this TMDL development, which as I understand it is uh, the work you are supposed to do to essentially put forward a plan to rectify uh, bodies of water that are considered seriously impaired. Right. As I understand it, you've identified uh, 1,900 of these uh, TMDLs. Uh, Total maximum daily load. Maximum daily load uh, <laughs> that encompass about 500 seriously impaired bodies of water and that only 10% have actually been adopted uh, to begin, I guess, what is the cleanup uh, of these waters. It seems like a very low uh, percentage. And is it accurate? And if so, what's the reason for it? Well, actually, the, the regional boards, the nine regional boards, do most of the work on TMDLs. And they have actually addressed about 34 percent of, the, of the, the listed water bodies. But the gap is still quite large. It's not 1,900 now. It's about almost 1,500, 1,483. And um, so what we're doing now at the state level is looking, working with US EPA. They have a consultant, TetraTech, and then with some of the regional boards who are, who are particularly good at doing TMDLs and are devising um, uh, some templates and some bundling so that we can start to get that number down from 1,500 to, uh, to a much more acceptable number. The first focus that we have is on trash. Uh, that is in the works right now. Uh, there are 37 uh, listings that would be affected uh, by the trash TMDL, but we think that's going to be a big one for future listings. So if we can get that in place, it'll, it'll at least keep the, the number from going up. And finally, uh, after we do trash, we will, uh, which it will not be easy, it'll, uh, and it will have to be adopted by the, uh, by the boards, we'll uh, may be moving to dry weather bacteria, another very, very large uh, area, and uh, suites of pesticides, pulling several pesticides together into suite and, and, uh, and addressing those. So that's, uh, that's the plan. It's, um, uh, as I say, the focus right now is on trash, and that will be if uh, we're going to be ex really experimenting and learning from that one at the statewide approach, rather than letting the, the regional boards do their own thing. Okay. If I might add to that, sir, the, the other area where we've asked our director, Dorothy Rice, to look into is streamlining the state water boards process on TMDLs. It's been um, absolutely confounding to me that when a regional water board approves a TMDL, it sometimes takes a year to a year and a half before that TMDL is then brought to the state board for approval. And then once we approve it, it must be approved by the Office of Administrative Law and then US EPA. And in some of these instances, the TMDLs that are approved by the regional boards uh, were done so without controversy or opposition. So we're certainly looking at streamlining our own internal processes at the state <coughs> level to quickly move the TMDLs along and remove that unnecessary um, delay for, for state board oversight. All right, are there uh, questions from other members? Are there witnesses in support of the nominees? I'm sorry. <coughs> Hold on, go ahead, sorry. Um. First of all, I, I I'd like to say I, you know, I would have liked to have been able to ask uh, more detailed questions in a one-on-one uh, -on -one interview, but uh, that didn't happen. I, you, know, you folks uh, 
apparently weren't interested in setting up an appointment uh, with my office. And uh, uh, so I've, I'm, I, I've had to go off of your written responses to uh, some of the questions. Unfortunately, the questions really didn't cover the number one topic uh, that's been on the lips of virtually every private and public person in my district concerning the water board, and that's your septic rule. Uh, I know that uh, you know the the state water board has said, "Hey, well, that's I mean facilitated by the regionals," and yet uh, you folks are the ones who are directed to develop and adopt um, and implement the statewide regulations for this, uh, recognizing that each of the nine water regional water boards may have a different take on how to proceed. Certainly in the 12 rural counties that I represent where septic systems are a way of life. Uh, all I can tell you is that my perception after having talked to the water agencies, the public officials and uh, private people uh, is that uh, whoever wrote, whoever developed and implemented these regulations knew absolutely nothing about the geography of the North State, knew absolutely nothing about the economics of what this would do to the uh, private homeowner as well as commercial enterprises and water systems, and absolutely had no feeling for the public sentiment before you went ahead and passed these rules and regulations. Now I understand that you're in the process of redoing everything, which absolutely necessarily needs to be done should have been done right the first time. And uh, I apologize uh, um, for uh, having to say this, but I'm not prepared to vote for uh, your nominations today uh, simply based on uh, the way the 4th Assembly or 4th Senate District um, has been treated by both the regional and the state water board on this one issue over the last two years. It has caused so much public angst so much private concern. I have heard uh, from public is issues uh, probably on a two to one basis over any other issue except in the last month, the budget issue, on this one topic where people, and I have not heard one good thing about the decisions and the regulations coming down from the State Water Board on this issue. Uh, I think you failed the people in my 12 counties um, I am very suspicious of what the rewrite might look like, and uh, I believe that it's that we need to probably look at the issue with new eyes on the state water board. Thank you. May I respond? Yes. Thank you, Senator Anastad. Um, the if I if I may start out by saying that the regulations of which you spoke have not even been considered by the board. They are draft regulations that our staff put together and as part of our regulatory process, the staff proposal is then released. The board then conducts hearings and workshops, solicits comments, and then give directions to staff in terms of any revisions that must be made. And that's where we were and we are with respect to those regulations. And um, I had the pleasure, opportunity, I'm not sure what the correct word is, um, of attending, as did Ms. Bivey Weber, many of the public workshops that were held. In particular, I participated uh, in the one in Santa Rosa, where I think we had a, an audience of well over 1,500 speakers who shared their concerns about those proposed regulations. And the board members who attended all the workshops took very seriously those concerns. We have directed our staff, um, actually we've assigned a, a high level staff to work with the um, environmental health directors, to work with other stakeholders, to um, go over the public comments very carefully and make the necessary changes before once again sending out a draft draft for review. So uh, it is indeed a very complicated set of regulations that are still in its very uh, early draft form for which we are working, seeking input and working with stakeholders and others, at least our staff are, in order to get it to the board for consideration. 
And let me also apologize. I, I know Fran did as well, direct our staff to contact your office, actually the offices of all the committee members in order to schedule meetings. And I, I do apologize if that somehow was not, uh, was not done. And we will be most definitely happy and look forward to having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. I do have a process concern here, um, and that is, uh, I know Senator Onestead is uh, very consistent in meeting with the nominees for various uh, commissions, and w what occurred that, you, we, did you we, reach out to the senator? Yes, but, but, they, but uh, well, I, uh, uh, Tam did, and I was waiting to, uh, on her, she was going to set these up, and uh, her staff did and heard nothing, so I don't know. Not true from your end. Okay, well, no, let's, let, let, let's not apologize. argue the past. Here's right. what's, here's, uh, we are missing one member today, all right? Uh, Senator Oropesa is absent today. And so um, what, what we're gonna do is put uh, the nominations over for a week, and I'm gonna ask uh, bo both of you to please uh, make an appointment, you can schedule it now, if we can facilitate that to, to meet with both Senator Onestead and Senator Dutton to, um, to have a, a lengthier conversation about the issues that you raised and or other issues. All right? Are there wit let's, let's hear from any witnesses in support here today. Well, no, I'll take the witnesses and be good. Celeste Cantu, General Manager, Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority, SAPA, we urge your, your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Harris. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> excuse me, Richard Harris on behalf of the Water Reuse Association, the state's uh, producers of, uh, and users of uh, recycled water. Senator Anastan raises a, an interesting question. If I just might give you a personal um, experience that our organization had with the board. We're here in full support of both of uh, these individuals and their leadership and the ability for, I, and I'm not familiar with the septic tank uh, regulations that you're discussing, but the process that you described is similar, to, I think, in, from what I was living when we were developing the recycled water policy uh, over a couple of years ago. And it started in a similar sort of fashion with information that was out there that was, you know, to our organization and to the stakeholders, uh, really not where we needed to go and not, not the right way to address it. And th through their leadership and their ability to understand really and take their dual role of, of wanting to help us expand our, our state's water supply as well as have to protect water quality, but understanding that there's some problems with doing both, they were able to bring that together, brought us together. We established a stakeholder process that had the, the industry as well as the environmental community and all the aqua agencies and came up with then a document through the stakeholder process on the recycled water and recycled water policy policy that I think is far and away one of the best in the United States and will really lead to the to more um, uh, you know more increased use of recycled water which we have to do it's the state's only new water source and it was really through their leadership and their ability to take that initial that initial document information and process that wasn't right and to turn that into something that then became a real win 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 for everybody so i just it's just a little bit of a, a personal experience with it but as you have your one on one with them which i'm sure you will find informative uh, we would you know we would appreciate your uh, total support for them moving forward we think they've done a great job thanks thank you uh, Mr. Chairman, members, my name is Jack Hawks. I'm the executive director of the California Water Association. Our uh, members are uh, uh, regulated, uh, ut water utilities regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we're here in, uh, in strong support of uh, both the nominees. We have a closer uh, working relationship with uh, Ms. Spivey Weber, so I wanted to say a few words uh, on her behalf. Uh, number one is that uh, uh, she has uh, great uh, strengths in terms of uh, facilitating and bringing together and managing uh, the uh, discussions amongst uh, disparate uh, water interests, of which we all know there are quite a few. Um, uh, number two, um, and Senator Steinberg, Steinberg asked me to speak from the heart, uh, she's got a little bit of E.F. Hutton in her. Uh, when she speaks, people do listen. And uh, in fact, when she is speaking at a water policy meeting, an industry conference or whatever, and there are a bunch of people out in the hall, 
when she goes up to the podium, the people actually come in and sit down and listen to what she has to say. I think that speaks uh, 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 greatly to her. Uh, so uh, the Water, California Water Association supports both. Thank you. Mr. Dillon? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Mike Dillon representing the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, all the major wastewater agencies in the state, including some of the big cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego. Uh, we, too, would recommend uh, reappointment of both uh, nominees. Ms. Dodak has brought a lot of experience to the board, and we've been working with her a number of years. Our folks in, the, in your packet, by the way, is a letter from Roberta Larson. She is our Director of regulatory, uh, Legal and Regulatory Affairs who works with the board members and the staff all of the time. And and she has great respect for both. And just to reiterate uh, what Mr. Harris said, every year, including this year, there are a number of bills in urging us to do more and more and more on water recycling. And so the effort that Ms. Bybee uh, Weber led um, uh, to bring about the, the water recycling policy for California is extremely important. And so uh, we would recommend their reappointment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Barbara Byrne with the Planning and Conservation League. We're also here today uh, in strong support of both nominees. Uh, I'd like to just second what Richard Harris mentioned about the process that brought about the recycled water policy that the State Board adopted this February. The Planning and Conservation League was also part of that process, initial shock and then later, later happiness. So we appreciate their work and recycled water does seem to be the topic of the day. Planning and Conservation this uh, year is also the sponsor of a recycled water bill and thanks to the uh, particular assistance of Ms. Spivey Weber, she was able to help us out with some technical assistance from her board staff. We also worked with Richard Harris. Uh, more stakeholders got together. We think the bill is much stronger now thanks to the very practical recommendations uh, that the board was able to help us out with. So we urge your eye vote when the time comes. We hope that that time is soon. Thank you. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Philip Bong on behalf of the Nature Conservancy here in support of Ms. Spivey Weber. Um, no offense to Ms. Dodok, we, we actually just don't have a comment for her as of now. We're just agnostic, so. <laughs> I'm actually a member, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll give that tote bag back. Are there any witnesses in opposition? All right. Uh, again, without objection, I think we'll uh, we'll put this over uh, for a week. And uh, and again, I would encourage you to get together with both Senators Honested and uh, and Senator Dutton at their convenience. Okay. Thank you both very very much. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Or are we? Or you don't need to reappear next week. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think you do. All right. Um, I want to move through the rest of the agenda. As I understand it, as Senators, Senators Dutton and Honested, um, the issues that you would either like to separate or put over are 2E. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to ask that we put over 2E. All right? All right, I'm there. Uh, yes, correct. File item six, is that, do you both object to file item six? Should I put it over or, or separate it? File item six. Yeah, my, my objection on that, I've actually abstained on all new select committees. On all new select committees. Senator Honested, what? what uh, it requires that. You have the same. So we'll put over a file item six as well. Okay. Okay. And we will put over, uh, what about file item 15? Same thing, joint committee. On the master plan. Correct. Okay, so we'll put 15 over, and then we'll we'll move to executive session in a minute. All right. So let's now then take up uh, file items two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Could we just delay discussion nine because that's just a discussion item. Okay, that's a discussion item. I'm and sorry. Eight also, we need to decide who we give the money to. So. Oh, we do. Okay, so let me start over. Everything okay. else is fine. Okay, hold on. Let's take up two with the exception of E. Three, four, five, seven. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 
16, 17, and 17. Okay. Very good. Motion. So moved. So moved. moved by Senator uh, Dutton. Please call the roll. Senator Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Dutton? Aye. Dutton, aye. Oropesa? Honested? Aye. Honested, aye. Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, aye. 2E, uh, that passes. 2E6 and 15 uh, will be put over uh, to next week without objection. And now, let us discuss uh, eight and, uh, I'd like to put nine over to next week. I know we put that over before, all right? But eight, let's make that, that decision. I think we had discussion last time, Mr. Schmidt, about uh, the fire agency. We have $4.8 million that we're prepared to hand over to another agency. Uh, in the governor's uh, May revision, he'd suggested that we give it to CAL FIRE, which the assembly had previously supported with some of their surplus money. We received a letter from Senator Wiggins requesting a $2.7 million uh, uh, payment to relieve the uh, general fund obligation for veterans' homes, and this would assist veterans who's, who would otherwise, I guess, be charged fees to cover uh, their residence there. So it's, those are the only two suggestions we've received, actually. I mean, there's plenty of different options. Let, me, let me give you a third suggestion. Uh, rather than us encumber it, designating the agency, I think it should just be returned to the general fund and let, let the, the negotiators on the budget determine where it goes. We want to add one more item to the budget negotiations? Get rid of all that. <laughs> that it subtracts it from here. <laughs> I appreciate the suggestion, but I'm, I, I'd rather, I think it's affirmative step for us to direct it to the way an I entity that it, needs to. The is, is $4 million. Um, if we direct it somewhere else, that's not necessarily going to be, in the total picture, reflect the cost savings because there's no guarantee that that $4 million will be subtracted in the final total uh, when the final negotiations are done. But I think you could feel relatively confident with the fire agency because we know that that's, you know, an emergency response and that the resources are going to be needed and used. We either do this or there will be four million dollars of a deficiency plus more after the fire season. So that would be my retort. A good retort. <laughs> but can I suggest yeah, but, but veterans, not necessarily the same argument. And so, and, and, and yet I don't want to go on record as voting against the veterans' homes. I have one in my district, or I have one coming up in my district if it's done. And, uh, uh, Senator Steele, maybe he can help us here. Go ahead. I can. I was just going to suggest maybe ponder for a week. I have my own little pet project, as Pro 10 knows. I was maybe looking at you for some support, bipartisan support on dental screening. A little $2 million piece there that we were cutting out. All right. Be fine with me. Something I thought would be good for all of us. Mr. Schmidt, Put a smile on our face. What, what, what project do you have? I have nothing. <laughs> the only thing okay. we can't okay. do is revert the money to the general fund as an unspent amount because that will lower our base for the come for the future. And right. we chose oh, not okay. to do that, and the governor understands that. Yeah. They understood that. Here's what I think we need to do. Could we, uh, Go ahead, Spock. Put it towards the deficit. Bill. As a deficit reduction towards the deficit bonds, that would I mean, fast forward, we directed to do pay down on that. As long as I can do it by interagency agreement with another agency as an So maybe what Senator Sadia is saying, maybe we ought to put it over because we, we I think we ought to look at deficit reduction would be another area because I'm thinking about what the people are looking at as well, being sensitive with Sam. Certainly the fire would be my, my other preference because I know right now we've got a problem. I mean, we've got fires going up down in the LA area right now in Sepulveda Pass. That's got some severe areas and so. With the drought and everything, it's probably that's going to over. That's going to have a problem anyway. I know that. Uh, I just want to say for the record that Senator Wiggins uh, has uh, suggested 
you know, part of the record here by letter that uh, we dedicate $2.7 million to the California Department of Veterans Affairs uh, and, and delete the proposed restructuring of the home member fees. So that's okay. Well, let's we'll put it off one more week. I mean, I I, I think my view is that the uh, the default position, not a bad default position, is Cal Fire and the vets. But you know, discussion among members. I like the idea of providing dental care to kids. I screening. I, screening. I vote for that in a split second. But. Let's see if you can create some consensus around an alternative. If I not, you know, Mr. Schmidt that, uh, alleviated my concerns, and, and uh, so whatever the will of the committee is. Senator C, do you want to wait a week or well, do you I want to give it a okay. shot? Okay. So okay, I, I'd be prepared to make the motion on Cal Fire, but I don't mind waiting a week if that's what. But there's no, uh, there's. We haven't closed the books on 08 and 09 yet, and they don't expect us to for Well, we'll put it over a week. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's uh, now move into executive session.